for make sure that we keep the lines quiet. You all are uh, muted. We will take time at the end for questions. Um, but in the meantime, if you do have questions, you can use the chat feature on your screen. So my name is Teresa Crane. I'm a grant specialist in Denver, and I am joined by the Grants and Contracts team in Maryland. We have Kate Ziffendurfer, Diane Westcott, Elise Woods, Maria, Marisa Pioroda, and also with us with Impact and Assessment and Evaluation is Lindsay Durr and Andy Masters. And we also have Dwayne Marsh with us here for, from the Center for Social Inclusion, which is now known as Race Forward. So this webinar is for uh, the national webinar. We have a rural and Native American webinar that we're holding tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, if you are unsure about whether or not you'll be, you're in an urban or rural area, you can go to our website at enterprisecommunity.org backslash grants, click on the rural LOI, and under, on page 12 under the geographies of interest, there's a link there um, to a map where you can type in your zip code. So um, this is for the agenda for today. We will be covering a little bit about us, the Section 4 Grants Program. We'll also provide you an overview of the LOI and some resources and reminders for you as well. So as I had mentioned before, we will save, uh, set aside some time for questions at the end. So, um, the content included in this webinar is only intended to summarize the content of the request for letters of interest. So any content within this presentation that appears discrepant from the language in the LOI is superseded by the language in that document. All applicants are strongly encouraged to carefully read the LOI guidelines and adhere to them. This is a photo of Jim Rouse, who, are, who is our founder. Enterprise Community Partners' mission is to create opportunity for low and moderate income people through affordable housing in diverse and thriving communities. For over 30 years, Enterprise has created nearly 470,000 homes and invested almost $29 billion and touched millions of lives. This grant opportunity is made possible by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Section 4 Capacity Building for Community Development Program. The Section 4 is named after the Section 4 of the HUD Demonstration Act of 1993, so that's how it got its name. The purpose of this program is to enhance the technical and administrative capabilities of community development corporations and community housing development organizations in order to carry out community development and affordable housing activities for the benefit of households of low income, which is 80% area median income or below. In order to be eligible to apply, applicants must meet the requirements described in Appendix A of the LOI. To find the LOI, just go to our website that I had mentioned before and um, click on it, and then it'll be on page 53, that Appendix A that talks about those requirements, which covers both the HUD requirements and also Enterprise's own requirements for um, demonstrated staff capacity, and if not the staff capacity, then at least the relationship with a fiscal agent or a fiscal sponsor. Applicants that are unsure of their eligibility can go to our website to click on the tutorial there, um, and they can also email us at, it, at rfp at enterprisecommunity.org for assistance and that goes to our entire grants and contracts team. So a little bit more about the LOI itself. This funding opportunity consists of a two-step application process. There's the LOI phase and then a full proposal phase. So applications must be submitted through Slide Room, which is new this year. It is our online application system. A link to create an account is available on our website and in the LOI itself. Applicants may submit only one application to either of the two open Section 4 LOIs, and then applicants may only apply under one program area, so keep that in mind as you um, create and submit your LOI. 
applicants that have active awards and or pending applications with other Section 4 mediator intermediaries such as LISC or Habitat, you can still apply to our LOI, but you should not request funding for the same cost. So everything that you need is available on our website and questions, again, can be sent to rfp at enterprisecommunity.org. We will accept applications from any location within the U.S. and applicants will be able to apply to either one of Enterprise's 11 markets or under the national geography. The total amount that we will be awarding through this LOI is about 7.5 million. And we anticipate that the awards will range anywhere between $25,000 and $100,000. The average award amount will be about $40,000. If you are awarded a grant, the period of performance may begin as early as July 1st and will have a duration of 12 to 24 months, and that period of performance will be mutually agreed upon by Enterprise and the grantee. So keep that in mind as you're, you have your projects and you're putting together the LOI that you will not get the grant agreements in, um, until September, so you want to think about that as you pull together your project. So at this point, I'll hand it off to our senior grant specialist, Kate Diffenderfer. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so uh, geographies of interest. One of the questions that applicants must answer in their application is the market area they're applying under. This market area selection uh, is based on the proposed location of an applicant's project, program, or activities. So you'll want to carefully review each of the definitions for the 12 market areas listed in the LOI, starting on page 7. And the same information is also available on each market area's attachment, which is also included in the LOI. Something very important to note is the definition for the national market area. The national market area covers all geographies that fall outside of the other 11 defined enterprise market areas. So using the Gulf Coast as an example, the Gulf Coast market area is defined as Louisiana, Mississippi, and Harris County, Texas only. So this doesn't include the entire state of Texas, just Harris County. So if an organization proposes to do work in, say, Tarrant County, Texas, they would select national as their market area of interest and not the Gulf Coast, since they fall outside of the Gulf Coast defined geography. Each market area has also listed the program area priorities that they're most interested in supporting, and this information uh, can again be found in the table that starts on page seven of the LOI. So using Boston as an example here, you can see that they're most interested in applications that address the program areas of health and housing, cultural and creativity, and organizational sustainability. However, and we'll cover more of this um, in a few slides, they will also accept applications that address any of the national market area program area priorities. So more in-depth uh, information about each market area's priorities can be found in their attachments, which again, they're at the back of the LOI. And the attachments will include any additional information or eligibility criteria that applicants must meet in order to be considered. So for example, if you're applying under the Southern California's program area called Preservation of Small and Medium Multifamily, they're looking for applicants that have experience, have experience owning or operating one or more small multifamily properties. The attachments will also include any geographic priority focus areas. So again, if you're applying in Southern California under the preservation of small and medium multifamily, their priority is Los Angeles County with a focus on eight specific communities. And lastly, the attachments will include a point of contact for the market area and a link if applicable to a market-specific webinar where um, market staff will discuss their priorities in more detail. And you can also get those links to register for the market-specific webinars on our website. So as I mentioned before, while each market area has described their specific priorities, they will also accept applications that address one of the national market area program area priorities. So again, using the Gulf Coast as an example, 
They are prioritizing applications that address their three priorities, which are financial health and long-term sustainability, affordable housing production and preservation, federally funded projects, and resilience planning, disaster recovery, and rebuilding. However, the Gulf will also accept applications that address one of the national market area priorities, which is attachment one, just for reference. Um, so if you're an applicant who falls within the Gulf Coast market area, and you feel that your application aligns best with, say, the National Market Area's Affordable Housing Preservation Program area, you can apply under that program area. Uh, because we're giving applicants the opportunity to select the program area that most clearly aligns with their proposed project or activity, it's really important to carefully review the program area priority so you're making the correct choice. When you're in slide room, and it's time to select the program area you're interested in, you'll see all program areas listed from the market, as well as all of those national program area priorities. So, um, Teresa mentioned the LOI and access to Slide Room, our online application system, are available on our website. To register for a Slide Room account, um, we have instructions in Appendix C in the LOI. Uh, once you create an account in Slide Room, you can review the questions that you'll be asked to answer. And we are kind of excited about using Slide Room this year because it has um, some great enhancements like um, compared to the system that we used last year. And one of those is that uh, Slide Room automatically saves your work as it's entered. So if you run into computer problems or you lose your internet connection, all of your work will be saved. And you can log in and out as many times as you need to complete your application. So Slide Room will also send an email reminder to applicants who haven't submitted their applications um, 72 hours before the deadline. Within a week of the deadline, Anyone who hasn't submitted their application will see a countdown timer um, set to the applicant's time zone to show how much time is left to submit. Um, we are encouraging you to carefully review your application before you submit it, um, because once an application has been submitted, changes can't be made, even if you submitted your application before the deadline. And unfortunately, uh, Enterprise will not be approving any requests to edit an application after it's been submitted. If you happen to miss a question on the application, a red link will appear at the top of the screen um, and take you back to the question that, were, that was missed. Uh, once you've successfully submitted your application, you'll get a confirmation mes message which will appear um, and show you your unique confirmation ID number, the date that you submitted, and the name of the RFP that you applied under. And you'll also get a confirmation email with information about your submission. So we recommend that you keep that for your records. And you can log in um, and review your application at any time, and you can also print a copy out from Slide Room. Okay, some submission deadline information. All applications must be submitted uh, in Slide Room by 11.59 p.m. Eastern on May 29th. Slide Room will be closed promptly at 11.59 p.m. As I just mentioned, um, we won't be accepting or approving any request to change an application after it's been submitted, so please carefully review the application before you submit. Any late or hard copy applications will also not be accepted, nor will any applications submitted outside of Slide Room. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Diane Westcott, Grant Specialist. Thank you, Kate. Hi, folks, and thanks for joining us today. So we're going to go over um, some threshold requirements in a little more detail and the criteria uh, for the scoring. So there are two. Threshold requirements, um, the first one, your proposal must address the needs of households that have an income of 80% AMI or lower. So within this program, a household can be a single person, a group of people living together, or any persons occupying a housing unit. 
Also, uh, your organization must satisfy the eligibility requirements as listed in Appendix A, um, as we previously mentioned. These include demonstrated staff capacity, and if you don't have that capacity, um, showing that you have an established relationship with an organization that could act as a fiscal agent or a fiscal sponsor if you were to receive a grant. And again, uh, more detailed information can be found on our website by watching our video tutorial, um, which I present, and downloading the associated resource documents, which are found on the same page as the video. So please note that applications that do not meet both of these uh, threshold requirements will not be able to be reviewed. So the scoring criteria is pretty straightforward and it's very similar from last year's LOI, uh, but we've added a new bonus point section uh, that you'll hear about shortly. Um, once again, we're using a 30 point scale with three possible points for that bonus section. And to be considered for the next stage, the full proposal stage, uh, your organization must score uh, at least 22 points. So there are four scoring criteria, <clears throat> excuse me, that will be uh, used for, by our review teams. Um, your activities need to align with one of our funding priorities. And that info starts on page seven of the LOI, as Kate mentioned. Also, your activities need to uh, clearly identify your capacity building needs and show how the, the, the grant will uh, address those needs. Criteria two evaluates the, the possible impact that your proposed activities uh, would achieve if you're awarded funding. So it'll be reviewed two ways. Uh, the first on um, how would it significantly impact your organization's capacity, and how would those proposed activities impact the needs of the people you serve? Criteria three scores the applicant's capacity and prior organizational experience as it relates to your proposed activities. Organizations should mention uh, past housing and community development experience, and you can do that in several ways, such as uh, showing, uh, talking about housing units and square footage developed and so on. The fourth criteria incorporates enterprises racial equity initiative and mission into the mandatory scoring section of this year's LOI because enterprise believes it's a moral imperative to address the racial inequities that are still sadly commonplace in many of the communities we all serve. Incorporating a racial equity framework will help us all strive for communities where every person has equitable access to safe, affordable housing and where race and origin are not a predictor of life outcomes. We're gonna evaluate a few things here. Uh, first, are you actively addressing or plan to address racial equity in any impactful way? And some ways you can do this, um, as, as we mentioned here, um, such as identifying current challenges, challenges on a program, systems, or community level, describing current or planned initiatives to advance equity efforts, or perhaps outlining changes that you will or are being implemented in relation to your internal policies and processes. And of course, including desired outcomes related to your efforts will greatly help our reviewers in evaluating your answers. Another way you can address racial equity is to identify your capacity building needs around racial equity and describe how the grant funding will help you address your needs. As, um, so as mentioned, Enterprise considers this initiative a top priority as part of our efforts to foster equitable inclusion and inclusive and sustainable communities. <clears throat> Including racial, in, racial equity endeavors within this grant funding round presents a pathway to the outcomes that we are all seeking. 
So we ask that you folks apply a racial equity lens to, to your project. Um, it, it can help to think about this as two paths. Um, what, uh, what, what would you do within your organization and what would you do for your community? So there's an internal and an external way of looking, of, of looking at things. There are some good resources on our website. You can start with an issue, internal or external, and apply the steps. Um, and that link, um, that link is found uh, under the resources area near the bottom of the grants webpage. And over, over the past two grant rounds, we've received received a lot of good proposals and thoughtful answers to this application area. And Kate is going to talk briefly about Avesta Housing and that organization's racial equity activities. So Kate, take it away. Thanks, Diane. So uh, one example of an applicant turned grantee that's in the process of addressing racial equity while incorporating it into their existing work is Avesta Housing in Portland, Maine. Under their Section 4 grant, Avesta is using funds to help preserve and develop affordable housing in rural Maine and New Hampshire with a conscious focus on racial equity. Throughout their grant period, Avesta intends to address racial equity primarily by preserving and maintaining rental assistance in rural areas of Maine. Across the United States, approximately one-third of residents in rural development 515 properties are people of color in low-income brackets, and any loss of rental assistance in these rural areas of Maine negatively impacts racial equity and is detrimental to non-white Mainers who have been subject to a lifetime of inequitable pay, education, and other societal supports. By hiring a development professional to focus exclusively on rural acquisitions and production, Avesta aims for a short-term outcome of rental assistance preservation and a long-term outcome of rent-restricted unit production. Additionally, they recognize their need to improve their organizational literacy around racial equity, and they're using funds to hire a racial equity consultant. Avesta has only a few employees who have a working understanding of what racial equity is and how it relates to affordable housing, so they want to expand their knowledge base across the organization. By doing this, they anticipate that they'll be able to identify ways to improve some of their property management systems. So, for example, for many properties that they own, Avesta is required by HUD to produce an affirmative fair housing marketing plan, and Avesta stands pretty cookie cutter, um, which hasn't changed much over the years. So, with a better understanding of racial equity challenges and opportunities in housing, Avesta hopes to update the document to more accurately reflect practices that support racial equity throughout their portfolio. And their measurable outcomes specific to racial equity um, includes having um, an improved understanding among staff regarding racial equity, which is a major step for their organization as they haven't uh, yet tackled racial equity issues. Um, under their grant, they've already held a training for 120 employees, and the focus of the training was to begin building a common language across the organization around racial equity and cultural differences. Two primary learning points focus on the value of intercultural teams and how perceptions and judgments are formed by individual experiences. So this is just one example of many that we've seen, and we're really encouraged by the thoughtful approaches our applicants and grantees have been taking as they begin to think about or incorporate a racial equity lens into their organizations, either by analyzing the impact of their internal and external processes, foundational assumptions, and how this affects their communities and residents that they serve. <clears throat> so with that, I'll turn it back to Diane. Oh, so, yeah, that's okay. So this year, um, we'd like to introduce another bonus question, um, this time related to Enterprise's Opportunity 360 resource. And although this is optional, we really encourage everyone to examine this valuable and very cool, I might add, resource. Um, if you choose to complete this section, we will score your organization's description of how the exploration of Opportunity 360 um, has helped 
your organization understand local needs and informed your planning for key projects, programs, or initiatives that will benefit from the proposed activities that you're going to do if you're awarding grant funds. And to provide an overview of Opportunity 360 is Andy Masters from our Knowledge Impact and Strategy team. Great, thank you. So last fall, Enterprise launched Opportunity 360 as a comprehensive platform that provides a, a 360 degree view of communities across the country. Um, Opportunity 360 highlights outcomes uh, that assess the community and pathways to influence and improve those outcomes. Opportunity 360 is built on a framework of five domains. Those are housing stability, education, health and well-being, economic security, and, economic, and mobility. Um, these outcomes are influenced by pathways at a variety of le levels. Policy and systems, neighborhoods and networks, uh, homes, and people. In this LOI, we are asking that interested applicants explore Opportunity 360 and the tools that are available by going to www.enterprisecommunity.org slash Opportunity360. One of the tools that's available on Opportunity 360 under the Measure tab is our Opportunity 360 Measurement Report. This measurement report includes over 150 indicators from 37 sources. Reports are available at the census tract level for every census tract across the country. These reports include percentile scores that rank the census tract and show the relationship between other census tracts across the country, in the region, and in the state. It allows applicants to understand their community and where their community falls in relation to other communities in those different areas. The Opportunity 360 measurement report also allows applicants to dig deeper and understand where the pathways to improving those outcomes are, what the data is related to those pathways, and think about how the capacity building available through this grant opportunity might allow them to better influence the pathways and better and help achieve better outcomes. To access these measurement reports, simply go to the Measure tab and scroll down to the map that is in the center of the page. Within the address bar, type in an address that includes the street address, city, and state, or simply include the city and state and begin to zoom into the map until you're able to click on the Get Enterprise Report within the white box. Once you do that, it'll open up on a screen and you can download that report as a PDF. If you need any additional support or questions or would like any more information about Opportunity 360, please email opportunity360 at enterprisecommunity.org. Thank you very much, Andy. So we're gonna take a step back just for a second um, because we have uh, Dwayne Marsh here from Race Forward to uh, give us a little more of a robust overview of racial equity. Great, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, you can go, I can go back one more slide. There's a little bit of uh, information on that slide that's probably worth having up on the screen. Um, and so I just wanna thank the audience here, but also thank Enterprise for continuing this work. This is now the third year that they have been taking an intentional look at how racial equity uh, can be advanced through the Section 4 program. Uh, we've been working with them and partnering them to support that exploration and really been impressed by the discipline um, that they've applied to now this third cycle um, of doing this work. I think it aligns with some of the larger efforts of Enterprise overall to think about how racial equity influences its work as well. So it's good to have this um, exemplar of uh, putting theory into action. Uh, a couple things I would just say is that the scoring criteria has evolved from the lessons learned and there's been an analysis of the first two rounds that were done. This first was engaged in the, um, in the first round in the, in the LOI process as a way to explore the, how this would be helpful. Um, then there were surveys done and interviews um, to recognize how that helped people in their their work to incorporate racial equity into their uh, Section 4 applications. The challenge is to support the diversity of the kinds of requests that come into Section 4, but to bring some specificity to the kinds of tactics that you can use in doing that work, and it looks different in different places. 
Um, I will say that um, in a lot of ways, though, the things that are consistent is uh, it comes down to analysis, to application, and to action. That as an organization, as you try to do this work, um, you can really have an analysis on how your work influences or could influence racial equity. Um, that you can explore the ways you practically can apply that in the work, um, and to, including internally within your, your own function as an organization, but externally in the world. And you can identify specific actions you can take that you hope will influence outcomes for uh, people of color who have been marginalized through systemic policies and practices that create disparate outcomes. And so all of these are important ways to approach this. We also have to remember this is a capacity building program. And so your request for support can be about moving you towards the outcome you're trying to influence um, on, the, on the ground in community. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. And so um, the question that the team, as they review, needs to understand to be able to evaluate you is, how are you thinking about these issues? Um, how can uh, this grant support you in that process? And what are the specific steps that you're going to take, either within your function as an organization or your application to the issues you're working on to, um, to be able to do that? Um, you see some of the criteria by which um, that evaluation happens, that you are, have a clear sense of the pathways, the outcomes that you want to accomplish, um, that you're applying this lens to your project um, you know, to say what you do within the organization or what you do in the community as a consequence of this analysis and um, you know, really explaining that the, the theory of change you have for the work you do. Um, we do have resources at the website that have um, accumulated in this work over the last couple of years. Um, looking at the issue, applying the, the racial equity tool analysis to your work, if that's helpful in thinking through what you're trying to get support for. Um, and there are other resources that um, are available as well. Um, and I think someone's going to actually share an example about how this has come into the work of Section 4 with uh, a grantee partner from Avesta Housing. And I want to hand the microphone over um, to whoever's going to share about that. Thanks, Wayne. So we're going to jump forward now and um, talk about very important dates that we all should be aware of. Um, so you guys already, I'm sure, have heard, uh, you've heard a couple times that the deadline for the LOI submissions uh, is May, May 29th. Uh, and it's very important that um, you guys are, are aware of that date only because um, if you, the, the system closes automatically. So if you don't hit the submit button before that time, you will be locked out, unfortunately. And we want to make sure that everyone who's working on an application does get it in. So um, just please be mindful of that. Um, the, um, for those organizations that are invited to submit full proposals, the deadline is Monday, August 6th, and again, please be aware that um, applicants must be invited by Enterprise to go on to that, to that next phase. And the submission deadline for full proposal, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up the date. July 9th is the full proposal deadline, and the, the, or the invitation, invitation notification is July 9th, sorry about that. The submission deadline is Monday, August 6th. So here's a list of our uh, key resources that can be found on our grants webpage, and you'll see these are all hyperlinked. So when you get this, um, when you get this presentation, you'll be able to immediately connect. Reminders: uh, one more time, um, applicants may submit only one proposal, um, and they must apply under only one program area. Enterprise will only consider LOIs from applicants uh, that meet both threshold requirements that have submitted their application by a slide room. And again, the date and time have submitted the application by May 29th, um, one minute before midnight. Uh, and requests to change an application once it has been submitted will unfortunately be denied. Sorry about that, folks. Um, late submissions, hard copies, and applications submitted outside of slide room also will not be able to be accepted. 
So questions, we have some guidance here depending on the type of question that you may have. Questions specific to a particular market should be sent to the enterprise contact person who is listed in that market's attachment, which of course is going to be found in the LOI. General questions uh, about the LOI may be submitted to the RFP uh, mailbox at, at this address. And please know that the entire grants team constantly monitors that mailbox and addresses emails um, ASAP. Uh, technical questions re related to slide room uh, need to be sent to the support team um, at that company um, for the uh, days and times indicated. And a letter of interest FAQ list will be updated and posted on our grants webpage every Friday through May 24th. Uh, questions will not be added to the FAQ after that date. And last but not least, and for the umpteenth time, um, when in doubt, send an email to us and we'll reply promptly. And with that, we're going to jump into question and answers and try to address as many as possible in the remaining time that we have. Uh, Elise Woods has been triaging what's already been submitted, so I'm going to turn the reins over to her. Thanks, Diane. Um, I want to apologize for anyone who is having audio issues in the beginning. This webinar is being recorded, so if you missed something from the beginning, um, you will be able to listen to it and catch up on what you missed. The first question is, are the slides for this presentation available online or will they be available after the webinar? So yes, <laughs> the slides will be available after the webinar. We'll post them on our website um, along with a link to access the recording. If my organization has applied for Section 4 funding from LISC for our program, can I submit an LOI for the same program to Enterprise? The answer to that question is yes. However, if you were awarded a grant from both LISC and Enterprise, you would have to have different costs under each award. Would choosing national over specific market area priority lower my probability of funding? No, your probability of funding isn't based on the market or national. You would choose market um, if, you, if your work is related to one of the specific markets identified, if it is not, then you would choose national, but it doesn't have any, um, anything to do with your probability of funding. The next question is, if we want to apply for a second phase of a project funded last year, redevelopment of property near transit, can we do that, or do you recommend we choose an entirely new project? Enterprise can't um, tell you what to apply for within your organization. You're in the best position to make those decisions, but I will let you know that you can apply for a second phase of a project for which you've already received grant funding. The next question is, we are applying as part of the national area, and we are wondering if we can apply for multiple projects that fall within the market area priorities. So, um, no, unfortunately, um, organizations can only submit one application, so you have to pick one market area to apply under. You can't apply under multiple market areas. My organization has a national office and multiple regional offices, all with individual EIN numbers. Can all apply for funding? Yes. Um, if um, you're an affiliate of a national organization and you have your own EIN number, um, your own kind of um, board members, et cetera, and you meet the eligibility criteria as listed in uh, Appendix A, then yes, you're eligible to apply. We are applying for supportive housing production. I'm a bit confused about the proposed grant activities relating to supportive housing production or if we should include specific activities related to racial equity. Claire, I think we need a little bit more information from you about your question. 
So if you're able to send it through the Q&A now, um, feel free to do so. Otherwise, send an email to RFP at enterprisecommunity.org and we will get back to you. We are a 501c3 working on sustainable development, affordable housing, resilience, and equity in the built environment, but not a traditional CDC or CDFI. Would we be eligible to apply? Um, so just to do our due diligence, we would probably want to collect some additional information from your organization um, just to make sure that you are, in fact, eligible. So if you could also send an email to RFP at enterprisecommunity.org, um, we'll get in touch with you soon and give you a list of the documents that we'll need to collect. Is racial equity something we should also include as one of the grant activities, or should that just be addressed in the racial equity question, but not necessarily in the grant activities? Kate, I'm happy to say a bit about that if it's okay. That sounds great. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, I think the thing that the, the, the team wants to do is get your honest assessment of how racial equity will be affected in the work you do. So you certainly want to answer the question when prompted. If, in fact, it has influence across the other aspects of your work, you should reflect that as well. Don't presume that they make that connection for you. Um, explain how it's connected. What you don't want to do, though, is just try to, you know, they throw racial equity around in all the topic areas to look like it's well covered. If it's not, this is a capacity building grant, and the intention is how can we build your capacity to deal with this as well as other issues. Thanks, Dwayne. Thank you. Okay, our next question is about Opportunity 360. Would you recommend Opportunity 360 as being helpful mostly for our projects in development, or would it also be very useful for existing projects? So Opportunity 360 can be useful across the whole range of projects. The measurement report can help really think about how to plan the location of projects, but also who are the partners and stakeholders that can be at the table in developing services and thinking about the, um, the look of the building, the feel of the building, how it can integrate into the fabric of a community. So I would say Opportunity 360 as a whole can um, drive a lot of the work in this capacity building RFP, perhaps about how to engage with communities and other ways that for both projects in development and projects already happening um, can be helpful. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions uh, that are specific to locations and where you should be applying. So in order to determine where you should be applying, Read through the attachments for the specific market areas, and if you don't see your city or area identified in those attachments, then you would apply under national. Um, since the grant period starts 7 one I assume we can start incurring costs before awards are made. So yes, it is possible to incur costs before awards are made. We don't want to hold up any projects that are already um, in the process of being started, being run, um, and so we will possibly backdate grants as far as, as far back as seven one eighteen, even though we don't plan to make awards until a few months later. Um, where is the racial equity tool worksheet located? It's on our website underneath uh, resources for applicants and grantees. And that's toward the bottom of that page. The next question is, the agencies have to be a designated CDC or can other service providers apply? So organizations that are eligible to receive funding must be a CDC or a CHODO. Um, a CDC is not necessarily a designation. You would just have to meet the CDC criteria that we have identified in the LOI. And if you have any questions about whether or not you are a CDC, 
send an email to RFP at enterprisecommunity.org. And as Kate said earlier, we may ask for some additional information about your organization to help you make that determination. There's a question that says, can we use funding to build new homes to improve property values in a 90% African American neighborhood? So um, you can apply to, uh, for funding for construction, but if you are applying for construction, you would need to be able to comply with all of the environmental regulations that are um, required for using federal funds for construction. So I would um, urge you to send us an email about what your specific um, requests would be so that we can get back to you and let you know what those requirements might be um, that you would have to comply with. Does submitting an application for my organization prevent prevent me from acting as a fiscal sponsor for a peer organization? Um, no, we would not uh, keep you from being able to be a fiscal sponsor from a peer organization if you applied for your own grant. Uh, would Baltimore be considered national or mid-Atlantic? That is mid-Atlantic. If a market lists that it also considers national priorities, is that of equal value to them as the priorities specifically listed? Uh, I think the answer for that is yes, that uh, the markets, if it says that they were consider national priorities, they would consider them in addition to anything else that they have listed on their attachment. Is three to one match required or scored higher if you do or other? Um, at this point in time with the LOI, we're not requesting any information about match. I will let you know that we will be requesting three to one match um, for all grantees, but at this point it does not have any impact on your score for your LOI. Could a national application include a mix of geographic areas from the prioritized market areas and outside those areas, or do all national applications have to serve areas not included in the prioritized market areas? So yes, if you're selecting national as your market area of interest, um, the proposed location for your project or program or activities should fall outside of those 11 defined enterprise market areas. Are grants paid out on a reimbursement basis? The answer is yes, these are cost reimbursement grants. Is there a separate application and different link to apply if my org falls under one of the market areas? No, there's not a different application or link. That will be a choice that you make when you enter your application or your into slide room. If the applicant is not a CDC, can they partner with one to be eligible? Yes, an applicant could, or uh, somebody who wants to apply but is, un, is not a CDC could partner with the CDC. However, that grant would be issued to the CDC that applies and that CDC would have to meet all of the 
um, federal provisions and grant requirements. Uh, the 20, is the $25,000 to $100,000 award range annual? Um, no, the answer to that is that that range is the total, the range for the total award amount. Um, I have a note from one of our, um, our market staff that says that just to clarify, when we're backdating the grant, that would be only for work that we're agreeing upon as part of the scope of work for your grant. And I'm sorry, Marisa, you had a comment about that? As a part of an executed yes. grant agreement. It would be a part of your executed grant agreement. So we wouldn't be able to reimburse you for costs until we have a fully executed grant with your organization and that those costs would be part of the scope of work in that grant. Uh, there's a, another question about match. Um, and like I said, this won't be um, something that we really need to discuss until later in the process, but the question is, can, does the match have to be in the form of cash or can it be in kind? And we will be requesting um, cash match. We won't be accepting in kind match for this grant. Uh, there's a question about applicants being prior grantees if they're able to request a scoring rubric or other feedback from a previous year's application. Um, please send, if, if you're requesting um, information about a previous year's application, please send that question to the RFP mailbox and we'll get back to you to answer those questions. Does an application that falls under national have to have a national impact? No, um, uh, an application could fall in a specific region that's outside of one of our market, market areas and have a regional impact and not a national impact. So applying under national does not necessarily mean that you have to have a national impact. Um, the next question is, these are not recoverable grants, correct? That is correct. These are not recoverable grants. Can funds be used for housing acquisition activities? Um, I would recommend that you send that question specifically to the RFP mailbox and let us know what type of activities um, you're intending to do with a $25,000 to $100,000 grant um, so that we can get back to you um, with better answers. Are letters of support permissible or desired? Um, we are not asking for letters of support, so um, they're not necessary at this time. What is the time frame for completing the scope of work under the grant agreement? Uh, we anticipate that our grant agreements that will be issued with this award will range in, uh, with a period of performance of 12 to 24 months. Another match question to clarify that the match the match would need to be cash match, not in-kind match. Uh, we will provide more information about match and match requirements um, when we move applicants forward to the full RF RFP process. Um, and 
we will work with each organization on a one-on-one -on -one basis if uh, you're chosen to receive grant funds and we will work with you to make sure that you understand the ins and outs of the match. How many grants do you expect to award? Um, we can't say for sure how many grants we expect to award at this point. It will depend on the number of applicants and the quality of applications in which we receive. All right, well, we're almost out of time. Um, any questions that we weren't able to get to, again, please send them to rfp at enterprisecommunity.org and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. I want to thank everybody for joining us today um, and best of luck with your applications.